Hello, Liberty lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I'm here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? I'm doing all right. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah, good, good. Yeah. Uh, I think it's Alabama summer. <laughs> you think? <laughs> I know it is. I think it's Alabama summer. <laughs> oh, man. It only gets worse from here, man. I know. August is the worst. <laughs> yeah, we ain't there yet. Yeah. We hadn't even hit 4th of July. Yeah. Uh, oh, man. I know August is the worst, but for whatever reason, like the 4th of July is kind of like where it like hits me. Yeah. That, yeah. Because I, because it used to always be like, we do a cookout or do something outside for the 4th. Mm. I'm over that. Like, I ain't standing over a grill on the 4th of July. I hate to tell you. <laughs> yeah. Like, never doing that again. <laughs> yeah. Dude. Uh, <laughs> most miserable I've ever been is trying to cook out on the 4th of July. Man. Yeah. It's a shame you can't do that shit naked. I know. Right. Mm. Mm. Oh, it's the worst, man. Yeah. I love shooting fireworks, though. Like, look forward to that for the 4th. But I ain't standing over a grill. Um, not planning to go uh, get signatures at the watermelon festival. Ah, that's gonna be a, that's a tough sell for me. Just like I said at the meeting last night, it's a tough sell, man. Yeah. Like, I mean, you're talking about me going and collecting signatures for a candidate I'm not voting for. So, well, you got to think of it as being collecting signatures for the party. I like so. I know, <laughs> I know your temptation to just like forget this whole libertarian thing and become a I, Republican. I, um, it's, it's not the worst plan. <laughs> it, it's it's a pretty bad plan. Yeah, it's not the you, worst. You think you're going to get what you want out of Republicans? Maybe I can change them. Got to change it from in the... every abusive relationship ever. Uh, oh, like yeah. we can make it work. I promise. Change it from the inside. No, man. You're like what the Republicans are here. Yeah. You're not changing what the Republicans no, are. The, the Alabama Republicans are pretty bad. I'm not going to lie. I did. There was an interesting bit last night um, where uh, somebody was suggesting, especially with our particular candidate, that um, we go after Democrat votes here. Yeah. Like, you know, people that aren't really interested in voting for Biden. Now, I think if you're a left winger and you're not voting for Biden, you're not voting for Chase Oliver, you're voting for <laughs> RFKJ. Yeah, that's probably uh, true. But um, even so, like, even if that weren't true, yeah, we're in a county that's like 80% Republican. I was going to say, it, it doesn't matter here in Alabama. The Republicans win in Alabama. I mean... Well, this is what I was going to say, though. I think you're better off going after never Trump Republicans. Yeah. I think you'd get more voters that way. Yeah. I mean, it might be a smaller percentage of the, the whole, but it like the problem, though, there's is so that, many more Republican voters. If you can just turn a small percentage of the Republicans. The problem is, is the never Trump. Uh, those are like establishment style yeah, Republicans. They're not going for a libertarian. Yeah, um, probably not. No, it's just it. it the, I mean, but they the don't. Fit's not right. They don't have an alternative protest vote. No, they don't. And, and honestly, Oliver may pick up some of that. Yeah, um, as long as they don't know who he is. And, well, that's just <laughs> it. That's, that. That really is the the, the the rub there. Yeah. So. Um, well, I mean, I hope. Yeah, like I said before, I hope going forward he just sticks to non-culture war issues. Just yeah. sticks to the big things that we are good on and consistent on as a party, no matter what. Yeah. War, economics, government overreach. Yeah. You run a good and, campaign and, off that. Yeah. And if, honestly, even if somebody asks you about this other stuff, about the, you know, trans kids and what have you, um, good politician can steer away from anything. Absolutely, he's and he. Like, well, I'll give him that. Like he seems like a good politician. He yeah, seems but like it's the, some, that's a thing that he's passionate enough about that he like. He's not going to steer away from it. it. Yeah, exactly. He wants to talk about it. Yeah. Um, that the, and that's really where the problem. Yeah, lies. that's the problem. the The correct answer is, well, that's an issue that affects such a tiny percentage of voters. What I really want to focus on is how much we're spending in Ukraine or whatever. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's not. It's not hard to shift. Yeah. The top and and he's he's talented enough to do that yeah. if he especially, chooses. Especially especially with the media the way it is today, because they are are not yeah. good at asking follow up questions. Yeah. As right. we've seen, at least with other with oh. mainstream candidates. Yeah. They're not good at asking follow up questions, but 
Yeah. Um, but then they tend to show you with our candidates that they can. That they're capable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh uh, gosh, I just that I had a terrible flashbacks of the Gary Johnson Aleppo moment yeah, right there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh well. Yeah. Um it's man, that was such a shame too, because this is more party politics. I promise we're moving past party politics tonight. So Yeah. <laughs> those of you We've done enough of these podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> but it was it was such a shame too because they only played that moment where he didn't know what Aleppo was. Yeah. When they'd been talking about some kind of healthcare thing, right? Before. Yeah. They, well, they were jumping and, from a bunch of topics. Yeah. So um, it's just like one thing to another. And then Aleppo. And he said later, he was like, I thought it was some kind of acronym that I wasn't familiar with. And yeah. Um, and he, he looked stupid there for a moment, but once they explained to him what it was, he gave a really good answer. <laughs> yeah, but they're not going to play that. <laughs> yeah, and the funny thing about it is, the, like, all those people, all those Americans out there that watched the news and saw that clip and how stupid Gary Johnson was, doesn't even know where Aleppo was. How many of them knew what Aleppo was before? <laughs> right. That? Or even after. Yeah, yeah. I, it's just, it's really funny. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, He's probably better prepared for a an antagonistic media than Gary Johnson was. I'd agree with that. Because Gary Johnson was a mainstream candidate before he was a libertarian candidate. Yeah. Um, and so I don't think he had to deal with so much of that. Well, Chase and, forced a runoff in a Senate in, <laughs> yeah. or was it the governor's race? I don't remember. He forced a runoff in Georgia, though. Yeah. Uh, and I imagine he got quite a bit of heat during yeah. that time period. Well, and... In, in, I'll give it to Chase as far as I do think that Chase is sharp. Like he's he's pretty quick on his feet and he's he's a witty guy. I mean, I disagree with him on some things. And and I like Gary Johnson, mm -hmm. but I've never felt that way about Gary Johnson. I didn't I never thought that Gary Johnson was like a witty guy or, yeah. or good on his feet. Yeah. Like I say, and, and I like I say, I wasn't a big fan of Gary Johnson, but I like Gary Johnson. Mm -hmm. Like I, I I didn't I wasn't embarrassed with him as a candidate, I'll say that. I, I don't know. I have my moments. <laughs> well, the second campaign was a lot worse than the first. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like the first campaign, like I was pushing him hard and mm -hmm. through a, most of the second campaign I was, mm -hmm. even though he got kind of embarrassing. Yeah. Um, but like I say, and like he wasn't my first choice on either of those tickets, by the way. Like I liked other people beyond him, but when he was the guy, like I, I fell in line and was like, all right, like this, I, I can support this guy. Yeah. Um, which is a shame, which is the reason I'm so upset about the last two candidates because I haven't felt that way. Like, even though I don't like them or think that they're the best candidates, like I, I'd still want to be able to support them. And I just don't mm -hmm. feel like I can. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, the, the part that you have to focus on, and I'm not a party man, we all know. Yeah. Um, but the part you have to focus on is that you align with them a whole lot better than any other candidate out there. Yeah, but I also, they're libertarians. I expect more of them. Yeah. I mean, that's fair, but you're certainly not going to make changes by voting for a Republican or a Democrat. Even know. Donald Trump. Oh, no, man. Trump's putting some stuff out there, man. We're yeah. going to talk about that tonight. Oh, let's start there then. Go yeah. ahead. Um, so Trump, um, I wish we had the clip, but um, I didn't think they even mentioned it. You try to get it. Mm -hmm. But basically he came out and said that um, he wants to do away with taxes on tip, on tip income. Yeah. So, which uh, anybody that's worked a tip job knows, like, you're only declaring so much of that anyway. Yeah, like maybe half of it anyway. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. But I think it is, it's a smart pitch, and it's it's like an easy win. It's like, yeah. you know, I mean, you're talking about cutting taxes that people, a lot of people, like, depend on. Like, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a whole lot of tip jobs out there. Yeah. A lot of tip a jobs, lot. especially um, with the gig economy, mm -hmm. um, the, the growing gig economy. Yeah. A lot of tip jobs out there and um, they're like that. That is a really great pitch because it makes essentially no difference in the federal budget. Yeah. Um, but it can make a big difference in somebody's livelihood. Oh, absolutely. And it's, it's an easy vote pickup. Yeah. Like any, anybody that's working a tip job right now, that's kind of on the fence between Biden and Trump, like mm. that swayed them. Yeah. Like, I mean, because I know just from my personal, like if Trump was like, oh, I'm going to cut taxes on like blah, 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 that affect me directly. Uh -huh. Shit, he's got my vote. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I'm just saying. <laughs> now, the smart thing for Biden to do right now would Is be say to the just same like, thing. no, to just do it. 
Oh, well, yeah, he could just do it. Yeah. That's, you know, that's actually the play. You know, he won't pull it and he won't do it. Because, <laughs> no. um, but you're right. Like, if he just was like, hey, that's a good idea. I'm going to do that right now. Yeah. Just take it away as a campaign issue. Yeah. Yeah. That would be smart politics. Yeah. Um, that's funny that he, <laughs> that you know, it's just funny because you know he's not going to do that. Yeah. Right? I don't know how that much, he can. Yeah. I don't know how much presidential power. There is over taxation anyway, or tax policy. I don't know. Um, I don't know that you can just do an executive order or something like that to get that done. To, Although, I mean, they seem to be able to use executive orders to do anything. For whatever they want, um, it seems it's like. Just a, it's just a king's decree now. Yeah. Um, but. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure Bush did some tax stuff in his time, didn't he? Yeah, well, he gave a bunch of money back. Yeah, but th- I mean, he had to have done that through executive order, right? I suppose. I don't know. How you know, I don't done. remember. I, I don't know. It'd <laughs> yeah. be worth looking into. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I hadn't really thought about it till you said that, but and, I don't know. You know, and it might just be an empty promise anyway. Like that that it, is certainly well. my big concern about Trump with the things that he offered to libertarians. Like, if you elect me, I'll do these things for you. Well, I mean, what's to stop you from getting into office and just not doing any of those things? Yeah. Well, and it, it particularly stings with him because he's been in office. Yeah. Um, and it particularly with the pardon stuff, like, I mean, he had those opportunities. Yes, he and did. there were voices out there really pushing for that after he lost. Mm-hmm. Um, and he didn't do it. So, well, Judge Napolitano said that he had him convinced to pardon Snowden and drop charges on Julian Assange, one or both. I think it was both, though. Yeah. Um, and he said he had him convinced, and he's like, uh, he got off the phone with Trump, and at the end of it, Trump was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And then he didn't. Yeah, yeah. And like so, somebody else got in his ear afterwards and convinced him the other way. I, I'm still convinced it was the deep state in some form, like... Yeah, like some kind of threat or yeah, promise, like, exactly. uh, you know, hey, carrot and stick kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know, maybe. I mean, I don't know that. I got nothing to back that up with. That's just kind of my feeling. Though. I mean, maybe maybe Trump's a lot more cowardly than I have him pegged to be, but I, I feel like Trump's the kind of guy that if he got that kind of... was felt like he was being strong-armed in some way, he would... That he would do it just to... Yeah, uh, just to spite Just him. to force, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know either, like I say. It, it's really hard to say with Trump because Trump definitely puts on the strong man vibe, mm-hmm. but a lot of times those are the weakest ones. So Yeah, like uh-huh. Biden. Yeah. Biden yeah. does that stuff too. He does, yeah. Um, you know, go out back and have their push-up <laughs> contest or whatever. I mean, oh, my yeah. God. This guy. Oh, man. Uh, I, I think the best thing... All right, so I was talking with somebody today about how terrible Trump is and how terrible Biden is and how terrible Obama was. Like, you know, they're all terrible. But the truth is, like, going back as far as I can remember, there's always, like, at least a few things that I can say I liked that the president did that. Yeah. I had, like, three things for Obama. Yeah. I can't remember them all now. <laughs> I remember JCPOA. one of them. I was going to say, I know it was that, yeah. Uh, relations with Cuba. Oh, that was right. He did Cuba, yeah. Um. There was one other thing. I, was, and I, I can't rem- I can't think of what it what it was now. Yeah. Um, but the, yeah, there were three things that I was like, you know, this president did these things that yeah, I really liked. That were positive, yeah. yeah. Uh, Trump, it was relations with North Korea. He got submarined on that by his own appointee <laughs> and John Bolton. But <laughs> yeah. um, he, you know, that was a good, that was a good move. He did some deregulation stuff that I appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he at least got us talking about ending the terror war. Yeah. He didn't actually do it. Yeah. But. But, and something else you can thank Trump for is, like, he brought the Republicans to that side. Yeah. Because pre-Trump, Republicans were all about the war on terror. Like, they were still very much the party of George W. Bush in that respect. Um, even all the way through the, the Obama administration. So, yeah. but Trump is the one who shifted them on that. So, like that's something there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fair. But then, of course, there's the nuclear treaties he backed out of, and he ended the JCPOA. And like, yeah. But I, I was trying to think today. What are those things with Biden? What are those things with Biden? I, don't I can't have come one. up with. I I couldn't come up with anything. No, I follow this stuff really closely. Yeah, <laughs> and I can't think of a single thing that Biden's done in his presidency that I'm like, man, I'm glad he did that. Yeah. 
I, I, at least he did that during his term. Yeah. I, I can't think of I, anything. I don't have one, at least that I can think of right now. I don't know. Something may come to me later. I, I just, I, but I'm with you. Like, Worst president just, ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh. uh, gosh. Um, so, yeah, I, I couldn't come up with anything today. I thought about it off and on during the day, and I just I can't think of anything that Biden has done in his term Yeah. that I can praise him for. Yeah. He ended the war in Afghanistan. I mean, well, he, but he screwed that up so bad. But he, but he botched it. <laughs> yeah, he screwed it up so badly. I can't even give him credit for that. He yeah. only did it because Trump had already started it, and then yeah. he delayed it to a point that made it a disaster instead of just doing it when he should have. Yeah, no, that's one hundred percent true. I mean, he botched that in every way he could have. Um, and then Ukraine, Israel, he could have re-entered the JCPOA, but he didn't. He decided yep. he was going to be tougher on Iran and try and make a new deal, which they weren't interested in doing. We already had a deal. We were yeah. following the deal. You backed out of the deal. Why you know, should we make any additional concessions, yeah. which is a reasonable position to take? Um, and then he had the opportunity. Did he extend? He didn't. Did he extend the, um, the uh, what is it called? Um, is it the open skies? Uh, what was the treaty that was about to expire? It was the, it was the last nuclear treaty. Oh, I don't know. It was about to expire when he took office. Did he extend it or not? Uh, I don't know. I would be surprised if he did. Because I, okay. I know most of those treaties have kind of went by the wayside yeah, at this I point. Yeah, I don't think that there are any left. I, there may um, not I, be I any. Think that, I think that, I think actually that Putin pr proposed a five-year extension and Biden ignored it. Yeah. That's my memory of it. I could have that wrong. Yeah. Um. Because I think there are no remaining nuclear treaties. Wow. That's a scary thought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not that um, I put a whole lot into this those. to this moment right now where we're, you know, on the brink of war with Russia again. Um, because we refuse to throw in the towel on this war that's over yeah. <laughs> in Ukraine. It's over. It's done. We've lost. We were destined to lose from the beginning, and we've lost, and we absolutely will not concede. Yeah. And in order to not concede, we continue to antagonize Russia and involve ourselves more deeply by essentially telling Ukraine publicly that they can target Russian like actual Russian territory yeah. um, with the weapons that we've been giving with them. With our weapons. Yeah. And, uh, and so Russia has responded by sending a nuclear subgroup to Cuba. Yeah. Yeah. Cuba missile crisis all over again. Yeah. And we say, Oh, you know how terrible of him to do this. There's American weapons all around <laughs> Russia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like we don't have a leg to stand on with that argument. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, we we're the ones that escalated, not not him. He yeah. responded, yeah, to our escalation. Yeah, and I I continue to say this, and I know people really despise Putin, um, think he's the second coming of Hitler or something for some reason, because if you look into this guy, that's a terrible analogy. He's nothing like Hitler at all. Um, I think that we should all be, and I don't like I wouldn't <laughs> I wouldn't want him to be my leader. Yeah. But I do have some respect for Putin. Um, and well, the main thing is that he has remained calm, cool, and collected throughout his terms yeah. as president. And he has always been the guy to de-escalate situations that we were be we were antagonizing. Yeah. Um, we killed Russian troops in Syria. He was like, oh, well, you know, it was a mistake. Mistakes happen. Yeah. Um, and even in this case now... Um, he's saying, well, you know, they're by the letter of their law, he could respond with a nuclear attack. Yeah. Like under Russian law, what we're doing now, threatening yeah. Russian territory, he could respond with a nuclear attack and he's made it clear that he knows that he can and said, yeah. but I don't think it's reached that level yet. Yeah. I mean, the guy has, he's cautious and careful. And I kind of wish we had leaders like that in some ways. I mean, you know, our leaders are rash and 
thoughtless and feel that they have so much power that nobody can ever respond to us in any way. Yeah. And well, um, we've, we've got. I think arrogant. that if we actually succeeded in getting rid of him, we would be unpleasantly surprised with the the type of person that took his place. Uh, whatever replaces Putin will be worse. Yes. Like there, you can count on that. Yeah. Um, we're not going to get, you won't get that again. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I just, I, because as, as ca- cautious and calculated as Putin is, his people aren't. And no. he, he takes pushback for some of that in oh, his yeah. country. Yeah. Um, a lot of it actually. So, I mean, you can, you can bet that if something happens to Putin, um, and they have to run elections to pick somebody else. They're they're going to pick somebody that's going to be more antagonistic to the U.S. Yeah, um, that's just that's what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's that's part of what's so crazy about this push to have Putin removed and get rid of him is because it, it's almost like the pow- our powers that be are like, yeah, we'll just throw some kind of puppet in there like we do everywhere else. Yeah, and that ain't this happening doesn't work out everywhere else either. Well, it hasn't worked out anywhere else either. But to yeah. think that we even have that capability to do that in Russia is just yeah. insane. No, I mean think about I- Iran's the best example. I mean he's. He died in a helicopter accident just recently, but yeah. I remember when uh, Raisi was elected, yeah. and we were like, "Yeah, this guy is, is a radical anti-West, and yeah. he's much worse than the guy that came before him." Yeah, and we're like, we caused this. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just, um, it, it's back to that you know my old adage: if you treat somebody like an enemy long enough, they become one, even if they weren't before. Yeah, exactly. And. uh so I, I don't know. We should be we should be thrilled that that man is in charge there. Yeah. Um, he has shown an incredible level of patience with our idiotic government. Yeah, <laughs> it makes you wish. Like I mean, obviously we do all podcasts about this, but like it makes you wish like we had better leaders. Mm-hmm. You know, like we had better people in charge that because there's no reason for us to not get along with Russia. No. Like I mean, they're a world away. I mean, there's there there's no threat to us at all militarily, yeah. other than that we just keep poking them. Yeah. Well, and it it comes back around to that question that I keep asking every time I argue with somebody about what we should be doing and or what we shouldn't be doing, really. Yeah. In Ukraine, it's like how many American cities are you willing to risk for <laughs> this country, yeah. six thousand miles from our eastern seaboard? Yeah. That has no strategic value for us at all. Yeah, exactly. But is incredibly important to the security of Russia. Yeah, yeah. A red line, if you were. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, it just doesn't make any sense, and we're we're pushing even farther now, even though it's lost. It's a lost cause. Yeah. Ukraine is lost. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, what remains of Ukraine? Is all that they'll have. I mean, Russia has taken half of the country almost. Yeah. And they don't want it, really. I mean, what they've taken, they they want probably because it's mostly Russian ethnic, Russian speaking. They areas. didn't, they didn't they want, don't it, want the rest of it. They didn't want it to begin with, though. Yeah. that's um, They rejected it when they, those, <laughs> when they had the chance. When those territories tried to join Russia well Initially. before the war. Yeah. Um, now it's just like buffer areas. Yeah. But, but we keep we keep pushing for stuff. We're just unwilling to to admit that it's lost. Yeah, because it's a huge embarrassment for us. Yeah. So but, how big a deal do you think this is? These subs off Cuba. Well, I mean, there's um, a lot of media coverage on it this week, and and I and I've heard varying degrees of concern from the media. So I'm just kind of curious where you put the concern here. Uh, my concern is more with the American reaction to it. Okay. I mean, that's fair. I, I don't think that, I don't think Russia is actually trying to threaten the American coast. I think Russia is saying, look, you can't stop us from moving our stuff around here too. Yeah. yeah. Like we're just as capable yeah. <laughs> of threatening your, your territory as you are of, of ours. So just keep that in mind. Yeah. I think that's really what it's about. Yeah. That's fair. Um, but if the American response is, uh, who knows? I mean, 
no. we go and try Start and spraying and, them with water cannons or yeah, something <laughs> or go and try and wipe them out in some way or yeah. attack other Russian territory or yeah. I mean, this could escalate quick. The, yeah. The American government is perfectly capable of escalating here. Yeah. Yeah. But there is no escalation dominance in a nuclear war. Yeah. Yeah. It's just destruction. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I know that people don't want to be cowed by the threat of nuclear war. Like, I, I understand that. Like, well, we can't just let them do whatever we want because we don't want a nuclear war. You know, mutually assured destruction is supposed to prevent escalation, not lead to more escalation because, you know, you can't respond that way. No, I understand what you're saying. But we're the ones that are escalating over and over yeah, again. Yeah. That's, that's the real problem is it's our government that's doing this. Yes. <laughs> in uh, our name. <laughs> you know, all, all the Russian escalations have been escalations in response to escalations from the West. Yeah, yeah. You know, they weren't, uh, they weren't bombing um, Ukrainian infrastructure until the bridge, the Karch Bridge was attacked. Yeah. Then they started bombing Ukrainian infrastructure. Once yeah. their own infrastructure was attacked, they started attacking Ukrainian infrastructure. I mean, yeah. this is how every step of this has gone. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Russia has been very measured in its response. And a- another big issue with this is that I-, I actually think that there's some guys in our government that think that, that Ukraine is winning somehow because Russia hasn't taken more territory. Yeah. But Russia isn't interested in... The remaining territory, for the most part. I mean, yeah. they would probably um, take Odessa, yeah. uh, given the opportunity. But um, but that's not really their interest. Their interest has been in, des- in destroying Ukrainian military capability. Yeah. They don't have to take territory to do that. Yeah. I mean, what they've been doing is they've been taking small bits of territory, digging in, and letting the Ukrainians counterattack and get destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. Just bleed them out. Yep. And they have three or four times as many people as yeah. Ukraine. Like, in a war of attrition, Russia wins. Yeah, yeah. It's just a numbers game. Yeah. So. And, but the truth is that Russia's already won. Um, the Ukrainian casualties that they've kept pretty close to the chest are far greater than the Russian casualties. Yeah. By any reasonable accounting. Yeah. It's, and it's it's just it's been over for a long time, um, and we're just unwilling to concede. Yeah, I mean, there's ways to concede and and still make it sound like a win. I don't know why we don't just lie like we do about everything else and say <laughs> this is a huge win. We uh, not only did Russia um, not take over Europe, they weren't even able to take over all of Ukraine. Yeah, right. And it's funny because that really is like the line they'll use because they've been pushing the whole, he wants to take over all of Europe for so long. Yeah. People will just eat that up. Oh, absolutely. So it's easy. To so back there, out there is, a, there is a, a, a legitimate way out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, I think the part of the problem is, is that the powers that be do still think, well, we're bleeding them out. We're, we're, we're bleeding Russia dry. Yeah. Um, and in, in some yeah. case that may be true, but the truth is, 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 as we're bleeding them dry, we're bleeding ourselves dry. Yeah. Like, like it's, it's cutting both ways. Like, yeah. it's not like they're, they're not communist anymore, actually. They're not, yeah. you know, they're not going to run out of resources quite as quickly as they did before. Yeah. Uh, besides, the World Bank just came out with some numbers saying that the Russian economy has grown. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I, I don't know. Germany's economy sure as hell hadn't. So, no. <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. um, and, I don't know. I don't know what's going on with Macron. Macron seems really intent on um, escalating in Ukraine, but we just saw the European elections, and um, his party lost huge. So I think part of it is a you know beat the war drum to rally support for you and your party and so forth. I think it's a politics yeah. game. Yeah, um, he just called for snap elections too, right? Yeah, he had no choice. That yeah. there. There was such an overwhelming victory for the right wing parties in France, yeah. um, and his party dropped to like thirteen percent or something like that. Like something. So the thing I was hearing was that that the game he's playing though is that he still thinks that in a snap election he can gain some of that back. Or- I mean, they might not. They might not do as he won't be as well off as. Um, 
I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, I'm not, I don't know either. I'm not, I'm not really embedded in, these... in European politics enough to to make good predictions, but but this is my guess. Um, he had to do snap elections just because of the overwhelming loss losses that, he, that his party took that they suffered. Yeah. Um, because it otherwise it looks like he's just trying to hang on in the he's, face. He's of everything just like else. a lame duck. Right? Yeah. 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 Um, they probably won't do as badly in snap elections as they did in the uh, mm-hmm. European elections. Yeah. Um, so. But he could. It but really it, depends on where sentiment well, is. Well, that's at. true. The but, polling is saying that is saying that that's not the case. But the problem is, is you kind of have the Trump effect over there with your right wing- wingers. That, that's true. That you know they. I'm I'm a, I'm under the impression that they're gonna play better than they poll well right-wing populism has made a huge surge in europe over the last many years uh mostly because of their immigration problems yeah well that's the that's the reason i say that they may they may do better than their polling yeah uh it could be um i i suspect that um that with snap elections now the left wing in France will not lose as badly as they did in the recent European yeah. parliament elections. Yeah. But who I don't knows? know though. Yeah. I don't know. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's still a gamble. Yeah, it is. Uh, but it's a gamble. I don't think that he has any choice about. Yeah. Um, just because of, you know, just because of how politics works anyway, with such a huge loss, he can't, he can't legitimately maintain that, that the parliament, the French parliament is as it should be. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. We'll we'll see. I haven't followed that really closely. I mean, I I read a little bit about it. I I used to follow that stuff a lot more closely than I do now. Yeah. Um, back when I used to watch a lot more European news. Yeah. Well, that's actually where I got my stuff from. I've watched some, I I still watch a little bit European, not a lot, but a little bit. Yeah. Uh, I don't so much anymore. France 24 completely lost me during COVID. Um, yeah. They took away RT from me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, I can still watch it on Rumble, I think. But <laughs> You got to go to Rumble. I got to go to Rumble. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's wild. So, what um, a world we live in. Yeah. Um, let's let's talk about this, uh, the Buddha Judge stuff, because I've All been right. holding these clips for a little while. and. Like at least a week. <laughs> <laughs> They're burning uh, the hole in your pocket. Yeah, and I want to. I want to talk about this Buddha judge's commentary on EVs right. and um, the economics of EVs. I don't know how we're going to play these clips exactly. We're definitely going to start with this one, and then we'll see how quickly we play the second one. All right. All right. Every single year, more Americans buy EVs than the year prior. There are two things uh, that I think are needed for that to happen even more quickly. Uh, One is the price, which is why the Inflation Reduction Act acted to cut the price of an electric vehicle. The second is making sure we have the charging network we need across America. Okay, so as Buttigieg explained, the problem with getting more EVs on the road in this country is uh, that the prices are too high on EVs. And uh, we don't have the charging network we need. And, of course, he's talking about the, uh, in the Inflation Reduction Act, he's talking about government spending and tax credits. Um, Government spending on infrastructure uh, to create the charging network. Yeah. And um, tax credits. Now, go ahead. I was just going to say, like, getting that charging network up is important if they want to make these goals that they've set out. Yeah. Like, I mean, you can't really do it without it. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, it's just, and, and it's not just the charging station. So the charging stations is one, but Thomas Massey brought this up a while back. Um, like even as far as like charging them in your home, mm-hmm. like we don't have the infrastructure right now to do that. Yeah. can't produce enough electricity. We can't produce, I mean, California already has rolling blackouts during the summertime because mm-hmm. people are running their air conditioners. And you're talking about, I forget how many refrigerators I think it, it was is. like 15. Yeah, like you're, uh, the <laughs> capacity of 15 more refrigerators to each house. Each household. Yeah. Like it's insane. There's no, like we're, we're just, it's not there yet. You have a secondary market problem too. Um, like, okay, so say you're uh, buying um, some kind of yard work machine, a, a lawnmower? lawnmower or something yeah. like that. 
Do you buy a secondhand battery powered lawnmower? I mean, I don't personally buy a battery powered anyway. So okay. I'm just saying, I mean, so I don't know, but I'll tell you this. I, I like the, I like electric lawnmowers, but the, the oh. battery only ones, like the batteries have to repl- be replaced over and over again. And the truth is that when the battery needs replaced, you may as well just buy a new one. Well, but, uh, that's what I was going to say is I don't see a lot of them advertised on marketplace. Mm-hmm. Like you see like gas powered mowers on marketplace. Yeah. But now that you mentioned it, I don't know that I've ever seen a battery powered one listed on marketplace. Okay. Um, how about EV vehicles? Do you see secondhand EV cars? I don't know that um, I've ever seen one for sale. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, that's not, that's very anecdotal because I, like I say, but I do shop for cars a lot. So yeah, I mean, I don't know. I haven't seen them, but that's not to say they're not necessarily out there. Yeah. I don't think that there's a lot of people that have faith in buying a secondhand. Well, and that is something vehicle. that, that I have heard is that, that the, the life on these cars is pretty low mm-hmm. because once that battery goes, that's pretty well totals the car. Yeah. And there's not a big market to replace those batteries like that. The car just kind of goes to the wayside. Okay. So, but obviously Buddha judge rec- recognizes that one of the big impediments to getting more adoption of electric vehicles is the price. Yeah. Oh, that's so literally one minute later in the same interview, let's hear what he has to say. All right. The EV revolution will happen with or without us, and we've got to make sure that it's American led. Mm -hmm. And that's what the president is focused on. We don't want China. Look, under the Trump administration, uh, they allowed China to build an advantage in the EV industry. But under President Biden's leadership, we're making sure that the EV revolution will be a made in America EV revolution. That because is of these tariffs important. we're talking about that President well, Biden says he's going to roll Also out. just making sure we invest in America's capacity. These are obviously plans of people that do not understand economics at all. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we have a real problem with uh, high prices in um, electric vehicles, and that's why we're not having more people adopt them. We really want more people to adopt them. And so we offer tax credits to bring the prices down uh, as one of our incentives. And um, But we can't have China producing cheap electric vehicles for people to buy, so we're going to <laughs> we're going to put heavy tariffs on them to drive those prices up so that we can sell fewer vehicles yeah. and because, have higher prices. Because clearly here in America, we can't seem to produce them at a, a, a good price. Yeah. The Chinese can, but we can't have that happening. Yeah. So we'd raise the tariffs to raise those prices. It makes no sense. It doesn't ex- at all. Like if you, you, either, really want, you either want these things here cheap or you don't. Yeah. Like you that's the want, thing. <laughs> yeah. You either want... Americans driving electric vehicles, or you want Americans buying from American manufacturers. You either want to benefit the environment or you want to benefit business in America. And obviously the real concern is business in America. Yeah. I mean, if anybody had any questions about that before, <laughs> here's another one of those. It's uh, on here's full some display. More yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, let's, which by the way, I'm all for American business. Don't, don't take me as somebody that doesn't like, I mean, I, I think it's important. I'm not a big fan of tariffs. Like I, I do have a problem with just tariffing the crap out of China, mm-hmm. but, but I do want American businesses to do well. Yeah. But the answer there is to just get government out of their way. Yeah. Well, that's, but that's the kind of the point I was wanting to make is like, there's ways to do that. Like there's things that the government has its finger on and control over that it can do to help America American business, but it's more of what you said. It's get out of the way. Yeah. It's not. It's not raise tariffs on China and make it more difficult for them to import stuff here. Mm-hmm. Like we want their cheap stuff. Like I mean, we need it. Like yeah, especially if you want more electric and vehicles it, and on if the you, road. Well, yeah, and it, and <laughs> if you want the American businesses to do well, pull back the regulation. Like that is an option. Um, it, it's not an option that's being used, obviously, but I mean that that will help. Yeah, I just wanted to point that out. I just thought it was so ridiculous. Oh, yeah. It's it's either that they don't want the things that they claim that they want or that they have such a complete misunderstanding of economics that they don't know how to get there. And it might be both. It could be both. <laughs> but But it just, what irritates me is that we have people in charge of these things 
that particularly in charge of our economics for the country that don't understand economics. Yeah. Like, I mean, how frustrating is that? Like, that's the most, that's the worst part of being a libertarian yeah. is that you understand all of this, this stuff and you have to watch people that don't understand it run it. <laughs> yeah. Well, remember about a month ago, we played that clip from the president's council of economic advisors, the chair of the president's <laughs> council of economic advisors that couldn't explain where inflation came from. Yeah. Like, I, it just it's it's astonishing that this country has gotten to the to the mess we're in as far as I'm concerned um that we just oh it's not astonishing that we got to this mess well uh, because <laughs> but it's because of the people like that's my point though is that we've that we as a people have let this type of of person get to that yeah, point it's just bad leadership yeah, I mean, it goes back to that thing was we just don't have impressive elites anymore. Yeah, and you can talk bad about Putin as much as you want, but like listen to him like talk and give a speech and like the man's competent, he's intelligent. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's it's a shame to look at our leaders and be we I, you don't see the same thing. Mm -hmm. At least not with most. There's a handful, and there's a handful on both sides. I mean, I think of my the Masseys and the Rand Pauls and whatnot. Yeah, but I mean, there's some fairly impressive people in the Republican. Republican Party and in the Democrat, but yeah. they're not the majority; they're the minority. Yeah, yeah, that's the uh, that's the unfortunate part there. Well, uh, I want to move on because we don't have a lot of time, and we've actually got a lot more to cover. Oh wow, okay. or a lot more that I wanted to cover. Um, I don't know. We spent a lot more time on foreign policy stuff than I thought because I, I wasn't really even planning on talking about that very much. But <laughs> well, that's we hadn't talked about a lot of foreign policy, and it's I know there's a lot of foreign policy going on. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to I ought to talk about the Gaza stuff, but I don't. Not tonight. Yeah. We'll just have to catch that one up some other time. Yeah. Um, I I wanted to talk about the just the legal system in America. We were talking about the Trump's 34 felonies. Uh, the big news this week was uh, Hunter Biden's felony charge for falsification of federal documents or whatever. The, it's like perjuring yourself on a federal on form. A for or something. Yeah, yeah. Um, Which seems, like I say, I'm not a fan of Hunter Biden, but it seems. No, this is a ridiculous thing. And actually, it shouldn't. All right. If you're a Second Amendment purist anyway. Like there is nothing in the Constitution that says you can't you can have a gun unless you're you use drugs. Yeah, yeah. Which is which is the question it asks? I don't. They keep saying that it asks if you're an addict. I filled mm -hmm. that form out, and I could be wrong. Like I don't want to say that I'm right, but I just don't feel like that was the question that I filled out. Yeah, it was something like regular user. Or yeah, something, wasn't it? Like I yeah. swear that was the question, but I don't know. I could be wrong, and it maybe it's different in different states. But it's a federal statute, so it's got to be the same across the board, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same form everywhere you do. I don't know. The media coverage I've heard just doesn't seem to jive up with the reality I've seen, So, but I don't know. Yeah. I may, there may be something I'm missing. Well, and his defense wasn't even making a constitutional case out of it anyway. They were saying that he didn't fill out the form himself or something. Yeah. Um, was at least part of which, their argument. Which also is also a ridiculous argument because ain't no gun place I've ever went to filled that form out for me. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Or let somebody else do it for you. Oh, like yeah. They oh, that, there. yeah. They stand I there mean, and watch they may, you. They may not like stand right over you and watch you do it. But. No, but I guarantee you if I go in somewhere right now to try to buy a gun and I have my wife try to fill the form out for me, something's being said to me. Yeah. I'm yeah. just saying. Yeah. That's my, ex I mean, from what I've seen. So I, I don't think that he should be prosecuted for this anyway. And it looks like he could get up to like 25 years, which is, which won't happen first off, but yeah. also is ridiculous Yeah. for this. Yeah. Um, they take gun, gun crime serious. I mean, they do. Like that's, you don't. That's not even a gun crime. <laughs> that, that That's how you it's classified. You commit a crime with a gun. Uh, he, he committed the crime by having one is the argument. Yeah. And I don't, no, I don't agree with that, but I'm just telling you what the argument is. He was issued the license, so I don't see how he, like. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so I, I think the whole thing is ridiculous. But the other ridiculousness of this is that. In order to prosecute this case, they accepted the authenticity of the data on the his laptop. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Right? So they accepted the authenticity of the information on that laptop. You mean the same laptop that people were getting banned off social media from during the campaign? That's the one. Okay. Very same one. Um, 
but there's been no talk of prosecuting any of the other crimes that are revealed from the information on that laptop. <laughs> on said laptop. That are, <laughs> that are far more serious, in my opinion, yeah. than him filling out a form, lying on a form that he shouldn't even have to fill out to get a gun. Yeah. Um, the the rest of that stuff, there's in, there's information that could support a case of corruption and influence peddling and so forth from him. Oh, 100%. On this, even if you can't connect Joe Biden to it, you still can't do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's a far more serious crime uh, dealing with foreign um, foreign nations. Well, surely they're going to get to that, though, right? No, not at all. Uh, there is. <laughs> you have so, no faith. <laughs> no, none at all. Um, there is a uh, there is talk that they're going to prosecute um, tax charges. Yeah, they've uh, been actually talking about that for a while. We'll see if they do or not. I mean, I don't know. I wouldn't know. hold my breath. Yeah. I, but at least for now, they're still pursuing that. Um, but mostly, I'm just frustrated about, essentially, they took the least of the charges. And you remember, initially, the prosecution. The prosecution. Justice Department prosecution. Biden's Justice Department <laughs> prosecution. Yeah. Yeah. Offered a plea deal on this case that gave him immunity from any other possible prosecutions in perpetuity, essentially. Yeah. Um, judge the, through that and out. the judge was like is there any precedent for this kind of agreement and they were like well no <laughs> yeah uh, right and, <laughs> they're like oh you must not realize it's the president's son that makes a difference right <laughs> yeah exactly uh, our boss's kid is, is you know yeah um so I, I this is just like a, a a token case where they can say see we're being fair mm-hmm yeah. So they took the very least of the possible charges that they could prosecute against him, and they're they're prosecuting them so that they can say he's not getting any favoritism. Yeah. Ignore that plea deal that got thrown out by the judge that we tried to <laughs> offer, but we promise he's not getting any any uh, favoritism. Now yeah. this is actually a federal crime, though. Yeah. Unlike Trump's, Trump's. felonies. Yeah. And then at the same time. You've got Alex Jones, right? You've heard like Alex Jones is supposedly getting pulled off the air or whatever he had. Uh, yeah. What I heard was he had some like tearful plea on some video. That's or what I heard. And, I, and it's been out in the media that there, I guess his attorneys or the, the other side's attorneys are trying to, I guess, take possession of the judgment. And mm-hmm. by doing that, I guess they're wanting to liquidate Infowars. That's just my my vague understanding of it. Yeah, and and my understanding of the case is that they have um, essentially made it impossible for him to uh, either bankrupt himself out of paying or anything else. Essentially, yeah. the court and his quote-unquote victims. Now, we talked about yeah. this at the time, that this was such a ridiculous case. Like, yeah, y- you can't even somebody intentionally lying, yeah. you can't really prosecute for general lies about a group of people. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. it's, 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 it's sets a, a, a ridiculous precedent for, you know, for anybody who's broadcasting anything. Yeah. Frankly, but they're trying to make a, an example out of this guy. They don't like what he has to say. That's really what it's about. Yeah. But uh, he can't bankrupt himself out of it. Um, the court has essentially uh, can pull any of his earnings again in perpetuity. Yeah. Essentially, they've ruined him for the rest of his life. Yeah. He will never be able to earn any reasonable income because anything that he earns, the court can take. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just insane. Which is insane. And then... Last week, Fauci testified in Congress. Yeah. Now, how is it that Alex Jones lying or at least being wrong? But we'll we'll grant lying. Yeah. All yeah. right. Lying about whether Sandy Hook happened or was a false flag. Yeah. Um, and rabid followers of his harassing parents, yeah. which is terrible. Which is horrible. Yeah. But... Um, how does that compare in any way to Anthony Fauci lying over and over again about how severe COVID was, how effective the vaccines were, how effective lockdowns and masks and all that stuff was, yeah. um, affecting hundreds of millions of lives? Yeah. And 
by at least some reasonable accounts from some of the information that they've been revealing, knowing it yeah, and willfully lying about it, doing far, far more damage than Alex Jones could ever do in his entire life. Yeah. This guy is not going to be prosecuted. Oh, no, no. He's, he's living cushy life. Yeah. So, um, there, like there was a guy before that was, uh, part of these, um, hearings before that was saying that, uh, he was actually Fauci's chief advisor, um, at NIAID or in the NIH or whatever, um, who said that he had learned from their HR person how to delete emails afterwards, hide emails so that they couldn't be FOIA'd. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is for those that don't know, FOIA is the freedom of information act. It's like all government correspondence, uh, can be <laughs> requested mm-hmm. essentially by the public. Um, this is so, what Hillary Clinton got in so much trouble for over having the server. Right. That, that was the whole server thing the was she was trying server. to get away from the FOIA stuff. Yeah. Didn't want information to be able to be accessible through FOIA. Exactly. And that's, that's exactly what they were doing here too. Um, and he implicated Fauci in some of these things like, uh, saying that, um, he knew that he deleted an email in a way that it couldn't be retrieved through FOIA. And he assumed that Tony had also, um, and so on. Uh, they knew that what they were doing, they were talking about, um, well, you know, if you have any concerns about anything, don't worry about FOIA. I can send, uh, uh, Tony emails through our private accounts or just hand deliver stuff to him. Um, so that it can't be, re- uh, found in FOIA yeah. requests. Uh, like they, they were intentionally covering up things. Yeah. Yeah. It's very clear. Um, intentionally covering up things. And then, uh, and of course Fauci's given his little weasel answers cause he's a smart guy, frankly. Um, which makes him so much worse. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes him that much more evil. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, he's being asked about his, um, his income off of, from drug stuff. Yeah. And he's saying, well, I don't think, you know, I didn't get anything from COVID. And you're like, well, no, I'm not asking about COVID. And he says, well, I get like a hundred dollars a year from this thing that I developed years ago. He's like, okay, but what about in the time period between 2020 and 2023 or whatever yeah. they're asking? Well, I just want to be very clear that I only get like $100 from this thing that I developed years and years ago that was used to make blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah. but No, but that's not what I'm asking about. Yeah. Now, I just want to make sure that you know that I get this $100. <laughs> and he, he just keeps focusing Going on that. Going back to like, that, yeah. And so if ever he's asked in the future when it becomes revealed that he absolutely made money off of all Which this stuff. Which it will, yeah. Um, well, it, it, it might may, not. yeah. I Smart mean, guy. He he seems to think it will, or he wouldn't be answering that question the way he was. So he he made it sound like he was saying no, that he didn't get any uh, extra income off of this thing. But the way he said it, I listened to it a couple of times. The way he said it, it sounds like he could always make the case that he wasn't responding to that question. That was still referring to this hundred dollars that he gets from the <laughs> blah blah blah. Yeah, exactly. Um, just real slimy stuff from this guy. But I did want to focus on, um, there's a, another MD, uh, in the house that was asking him questions and actually said a lot of things about him being offended as he was treating patients during COVID, during COVID late nights in the ER, that his, idea of how to treat the patients was being overruled essentially by a bunch of bureaucrats that didn't treat any patients at all yeah, <laughs> and so on. But he, he plays this old clip of Fauci. It sounds like a phone call. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it was recorded. I think it was a phone call, uh, but he's responding to um, one of his assistants or advisors or aides or whatever about like, well, how are we going to implement these policies? Because, you know, the, the, uh, the government is really try shies away from required <laughs> vaccines and things like this. Holding somebody down and sticking a needle in their arm. Yeah. Um, and this is his response to that. Once people feel empowered and protected legally, you are going to have schools, universities, 
and colleges are going to say, you want to come to this college, buddy? You're going to get vaccinated. Lady, you're going to get vaccinated. Yeah. Big corporations like Amazon and Facebook and, and, and all of those others are going to say, you want to work for us? You get vaccinated. And it's been proven that when you make it difficult for people in their lives, they lose their ideological bullshit and they get vaccinated. Okay. Now, that's some real, again, <laughs> Weasley stuff right there. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think he actually has it backwards a little bit. Now, he's saying that um, once we provide the legal cover for companies and schools and so forth, that they will, um, they will apply their own requirements of these vaccines in order to function within that particular society. Yeah. Right. And uh, now it actually, I think works the other way in that once you have made these government recommendations, you have opened all these, these entities, these institutions up to lawsuits if they don't follow them yep. and something happens. Yep. If anybody gets sick at that school and the government recommended vaccines for everybody and the school didn't require vaccines for everybody and somebody gets sick and something and ends up in the hospital, then they can go after the institution. That's what he's actually created because all of this is pushed by lawfare of various kinds. Yep. Um, so what you've actually done is you've set a legal precedent to allow lawsuits if the recommendations aren't followed. Yeah. You're not, you're not giving the institution legal cover. You're giving, you're actually giving them legal liability. Yep. Exactly. Right. So, um, which is the reason they get so irritated with libertarians when they start the whole, well, you, it's a private business. They can do as they want. Well, mm -hmm. not when the government is, is putting out crap like this. Yeah. Like that's, that's the difference. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, there, there is a difference between that. And I, it irritates me that libertarians won't recognize that. Yes. Some libertarians, plenty do, but some don't. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a <laughs> it's a difficult line to, to follow as a libertarian. Yeah. Well, you just, you have to look beyond the first layer. Like that's, that's what it boils yeah. down to is you, you've got to look a little deeper than just like the old, well, but private businesses can do it they, as they please. And mm -hmm. that's just that you got to go like another layer deeper to find, to find the government because mm -hmm. it's there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely true. People always stop short of the government level. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but the other part is just like how evil and planned this whole thing was. Oh, yeah. He knew exactly what he was doing Yep. when they set these things. And he said, okay, this is how we get compliance. We make people's lives difficult. Yeah. We destroy their lives unless they do what we say. Exactly. And that he did was... it intentionally. Oh, without question. And he knew the kind of influence he had. Mm -hmm. And he even was saying in this meeting, he's like, oh, well, you know, when somebody confronted him about all the... Uh, the secondary effects of lockdowns. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the drug addictions, the, uh, you know, the suicides, the like kids all getting the behind in school. Yeah. yeah. All, all these things, um, more domestic violence, et cetera. I don't know that they mentioned all those things, but they were talking to him about the secondary effects things, yeah. that cause so many t destruction to so many lives in so lives. many ways. Yeah. Um, and he said, well, you know, uh, our responsibility here is just to make recommendations about the particular public health uh, crisis that we're facing. And it's up to other people to look at those other things. And hopefully, you know, now we know to look at those other things. Like, come on, man, you didn't. No, you're a public health official. All of those other things are part of public health, too. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And um, you didn't. You're telling you me that say... you didn't consider any secondary effects of locking people in their homes for weeks or months or years at a time. Well, and we were talking about this in real time. Like yeah. this is like, it's not like nobody had thought about this stuff. Like we were talking about it. And I know if we were talking about it, it was out there. Well, absolutely. We like, weren't the, the only people spent, talking about it that I spent a bunch of time on. And I, I say I, because there were a whole lot of episodes that I did you, alone, yeah. but um, I spent a whole lot of time trying to point out to people as they were destroying, actively destroying our economy, yeah. that the biggest cause of mortality in almost any industrialized country is poverty. Yeah. Yeah. 
and that you're, you're essentially just creating like taking away all these people's livelihoods and that there's going to be a huge impact on mortality in this country because you've made a whole bunch of people poor. Yeah. Yeah. And miserable on top yeah. of that. Yeah. Well, depression goes with that. Well, yeah, obviously. So, but yeah. Um, and, and I was trying to point out all these things. I was trying to point out increases in substance abuse, uh, overdoses and so forth, ending up in the ERs. Child abuse ending up in the ERs, yeah. which is really serious, like huge yeah. percentage increase, 30% increase in child abuse cases ending up in the ERs, um, huge percentage increases in calls to suicide hotlines and so forth. I was like, yeah. these things matter. Yeah. This is going to be like, you have to, you have to compare these kinds of losses with the potential losses of people getting sick. Yeah. And it's not just potential losses. And even when you're talking about the potential losses of people getting sick, you're not just talking about what's the mortality rate of the disease. No. You're also talking about what's the mortality rate of the disease and the chances that any individual will get it. Yeah. Yeah. Which changes that which, number <laughs> significantly sometimes. Yeah. And I understand that they're trying to mitigate the chances of spread, but he's just outright lying to people. And the other big part of it is that he was going around. He claims that he wasn't now, but he was going around telling people that vaccines would prevent you from getting sick. Yeah. And they would prevent you from getting sick. And even if you got sick, it would be so mild, you wouldn't even realize it. You wouldn't be able to pass it on to anybody else. And when that was going on, I was sitting, sitting behind this mic and saying, those claims that they're making, they cannot possibly know. Yeah. There is no way they have the data to be able to tell you that right now. Yeah. And I got a lot of heat from people about that. You're telling people not to take the vaccine. No, I never said that don't take the vaccine. I said, but no, what you're getting into, the, the claims that they're making about this vaccine, they, they may or may not be true, they can't but they don't know it. Yeah, yeah. And they were all saying it. And, you know, they give a lot of pushback to Biden. In fact, I heard somebody say that, well, Biden had a gaffe where he said that. No, he said that over and over. And it wasn't just Biden. It yeah. was everybody. And Biden said it over and over again long after everybody knew it wasn't true. Yeah, exactly. He was the last one to get off the train. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, but Fauci was absolutely saying that. When I was in um, in uh, Switzerland with my cousin, yeah. he was saying, nobody ever said that it would keep you from getting the virus. It's like, yeah. yes, they did. That was over the pitch. and over and over again. I know people that got it for just that reason. Yeah. That, because when I was, I didn't tell anybody not to get it. I was just, like you said, I was telling people to be cautious about it and to think about it. But um, but I know plenty of people that when I was having those conversations with them, they were just like, yeah, but if I can prevent somebody else from getting it, like I'm willing to do it. Like that's that's that was a big selling point for a lot of people. And it was just a I mean, I think it was a lie. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I think so, too. I, I um I don't fault anybody from going and getting the vaccine. No, you make your um, own decisions. And I don't fault people for wearing masks for a while. <laughs> yeah. When I see people in masks now, I, <laughs> yeah. I fault them. Um, but I don't, I, you know, I don't fault people for wearing masks for a while. I don't fault people for locking down because um, they were scared. And I still recommend to people that if you're sick, you should stay away from people. You should quarantine yourself when you're sick because yeah. I just think that that's good practice generally. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's not spread this, whatever yeah. it is. Whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but to put so much faith in the government and this guy particularly who was the face of all of this and is now trying to weasel his way out of every little bit of it. Mm -hmm. um, like I really want to see this guy prosecuted and it's not going to happen, but mm -hmm. we are absolutely going after Alex Jones and we are absolutely going after Donald Trump. And we've got a little token case against Hunter Biden yeah. and Fauci will walk away scot-free and he is the worst criminal of them all. For sure. Without question. <sighs> And it's so just, it just, just irritates. Yeah. Me. It just yeah. comes back around to the, the idea of the rule of law is a myth. Yeah. Um, there's a, Jonathan Hasness wrote, a, a, an essay called the myth of the rule of law or something like that. And it's, I don't know, it's 20 pages or so, 20, 25 pages maybe. And everybody should go out and read it because you'll realize that like, this is just, this is just a control mechanism. The idea of the rule of law is just a control mechanism. It's so that you feel that things are objective, but they're not. Yeah. And if you look at it closely, even under the rule of law, you can see that it's not objective. It's absolutely subjective. They didn't go after Hillary Clinton. 
mm. for her crimes. Nope. They won't go after Tony Fauci for his crimes. And if they liked Donald Trump, they wouldn't go after him either. No. They're not going after Joe Biden for his crimes. No, which they have a whole laptop that I'm sure has information on it that could be used. Yeah, which they have now admitted is real. Yes, <laughs> right. So anyway, um, so that's that's where we are, and we're over an hour, so we should probably wrap up. Yeah. Um, on that lovely note. Yeah, a little, <laughs> get a little ranty and yelly at the end there. Yeah. Um, but. We expect to be back here next week, uh, right? As far as I know, <laughs> okay. like I'm racking my brain thinking <laughs> yeah. of what I got going on next week. So we expect to be back here next week. Uh, in the meantime, you can follow us on Facebook. You can subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, Podbean. Uh, like and share, comment, subscribe, um, leave reviews. You can always email me at michael at Um That's all the stuff, right? I think so. I think so too. So, uh, We'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later.